see I see a quorum. So I'm gonna. My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is September 29th. It's 2:03 uh, p.m. Um, this is a meeting of the uh, Cannabis Control Board Advisory Committee, and I'm calling it to order. Um, we have a lot to cover today, and so I'm gonna um, just ask for invite for the advisory committee uh, members to, if you've had a chance to review the minutes um, from our meeting on. August 18th, 2021. Um, if I could have a, a motion to approve those minutes. Motion to approve, it's Chris Walsh. And is there a second? Second. Okay, second. All, all in favor? Any discussion, sorry? All in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay, well, with that, I, I, you know, I really appreciate all the work you've been doing. I just can't believe uh, the amount of time you all have volunteered, given to us, um, given to the board. The conversation, I think, is moving in a very positive direction. Um, I announced at our last Cannabis Board meeting that our October 1st report is likely about two weeks, I think, behind schedule. That doesn't really take the pressure off of you all all that much. I think um, the more we can get through today, the better. Um, so I'm just going to turn things over to Gina to pick up with the agenda under um, kind of social equity in the criteria there. OK, thank you. Um, is it possible to just share the agenda? I sort of had sort of what we had gone over um, for a social equity that wasn't in there, which was um, the potential of creating a DEI program too. I don't know if you want me to review that as well. Sure, please. Yeah, we have, okay. um, yeah, if you, I think we have uh, your presentation, which can include all of that um, going until about 2.30. Okay, great, thanks. Um, is it possible to share the slides or do you want me to just verbally tell everybody? Uh, Nellie will give you kind of co-host permission. Great, thank you. I always think it's helpful when, some, when people can follow along with something visual. Sorry, Teams is uh, disagreeing with me. Oh, um, I know how it happens. Well, I'm just going to start <laughs> out with um, sort of explaining um, the responsibility of the Social Equity Committee was to determine what a social equity candidate was going to be. And I know that there was potential legislation out there to help women um, along with people with disabilities. And so from the social equity perspective for people who have been impacted by the cannabis prohibition, you know, we needed to show that. Um, for example, as people, um, minorities, those social economic communities. Um, so the committee has made a decision um, with the board's approval to make both a social equity program and a DEI program, so diversity, equity, and inclusion program. And that DEI would have to be on the scrutiny test of was a person or applicant historically underrepresented in society, which would bring in the woman aspect and people with disability as well. Um, which then after deciding, okay, we're first gonna focus on social equity, we were able to come up with what a social equity candidate is, what are the qualifications for that program. Um, so social equity applicant needed to meet at least one of the um, three criterias. The first one being living in an opportunity zone, um, which is low social economic um, 
communities. There are 25 in the state of Vermont, which has been determined uh, previously along with the IRS of those most in need. This also carries a high um, rate of BIPOC community as well. This second was being a member of a BIPOC or minority race. After reading quite a lot of reports about pullover rates on the side of um, the roads and also incarceration rates for the people who, um, for cannabis, we've made a determination that there was enough proof to show that they were highly impacted on the war on cannabis in Vermont. And then the third is if you were convicted of a cannabis-related offense. Um, so have you personally been arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis offense and or um, a family member um, who was impacted by someone being incarcerated, arrested, convicted of a cannabis offense? Um, we've also made a determination that no previous residential fee in Vermont was required, but you must currently live in the state. Now, the residence, there's no residency requirement. Previous residency requirement was made due to some new litigation that was popping up in different areas due to residency requirements towards their social equity program. Um, there were some states that were debating if this interfered with interstate commerce. Um, so in response to that, um, the subcommittee is rec making a recommendation that no previous residency is required. We then went on to what impacted family was. And that's, as we said, as a qualifying candidate, you needed, if you had a family member that was convicted or arrested of a cannabis conviction, the family members include a parent, a legal guardian, a sibling, a spouse, a child, a minority in one's guardianship, a grandparent or grandchild. And then we've also spoken about supporting documents for social equity candidates. So, you know, proof of conviction. You know, what did you have? A, do you have a document showing the court dates? Do you have a document of pro, uh, probation documents? Also, what is the proof of residency? So, Vermont driver's license, registration cards, um, recent tax bills, bank statements, notarized affidavit, school district requirements. Um, utility bills, all of these to prove that you are currently residing in the state of Vermont. We've also discussed um, that anyone who applies for a social equity licensee business and receives an application, then it has to be at least 51% owned by one or more social equity candidate. Um, social equity candidates must be involved with the daily operations and must be able to make decisions regarding the business. So we actually want the person participating in the business. This was put in to prevent people who start up businesses in other people's names in order to receive those benefits. And also, any social equity candidate must meet state requirements to open a business. So it is not just the social equity, it's not the social equity's job to say that they can open a business or not. They still have to comply with state statutes and any statutes that the Vermont Cannabis Control Board may make on having um, an, being a licensee holder for the state of Vermont. And so those are the permanent decisions that we have made so far. Um, we're currently, up for vote on Thursday will be starting the benefits that social equity candidates would receive first in regards to applications and licensing fees. Right now, um, I'm not sure, Pepper, would you like me to go into that or shall we stop here since a full decision hasn't been made about that? I didn't catch that. I'm wondering how the substitute 
Trevor's and Pepper? Do you want them to talk about the stuff that they haven't finished? Yeah, I think so. At this point, um, it's good to get, I think, everything out there and then let the full advisory committee ask questions and kind of um, bring their concerns and input forward. So, yes. Okay. Great. So one of our recommendation with that application fees should be waived. And then the licensing fee for the first year should be waived. And then there's a tier system, um, which is in the second, third, and fourth year, there be at different fees, um, increasing by 25% each year. So the first year you would have it waived. The second year would be a 25% of whatever the licensee fee is. The third year, 50%, fourth year is 75%, and the fifth year would be free. Uh, it would be free, a uh, full price, so that we feel that within the five years, a social equity licensee should be able to pay full price and be fully sustainable on their own. There is a caveat, which is if you are not able to afford the licensing fee in the first or second year, you are able to apply for a waiver. So that will give you either a reduced or full waiver of the fee for that year. But you also have to come with a business plan of how you are remedying the situation. So we want to make sure that you're fully aware of it and how it's going to be changed. Not that there's just a financial need. Um, so both financial need and plans to remedy the situation must be given with that application. And then up and coming discussions that we will have is fee reduction, um, program benefits for social equity applicants, licensing, special licensing fees, um, and special licensings for them, which is co-ops we'll be discussing. We'll also be discussing um, delivery, possible delivery licenses. Um, also what transfer of ownership of social equity licensees um, for their businesses, cannabis social equity board, um, application approval, expungement, automatic expungement with social justice, um, reinvestment into disproportionately impacted areas. And then finally, coming back to diversity, equity, and inclusion program and having protocol of who would be qualify for that program and how would we run and what would those benefits be as well. And the DEI program is just to ensure that we can be as inclusive and help everyone who is at the greatest need in Vermont, but to do it in the most constitutional way. So I know that was a lot to take in and there's still a lot that we need to um, go, but does anyone have questions or comments? How, how does everybody feel about the criteria of a social equity candidate that they need Gina, to see? I can't see the person who has the hand raised. Yeah, it's Stephanie Smith, but um, you are a presenter now. If you want to pull them up, I know, you know, you've been through okay. them and thank you for doing that. If, but if people need to see it uh, as a visual aid to kind of, uh, it might help the conversation. And Sivan has his hand up as well. Okay, and so I think it's, uh, uh, Stephanie first and then Sivan. Hi, Stephanie Smith with the Agency of Agriculture. Um, I had a question with respect to the, um, I think it was bullet three under qualifications, or it's a bullet on my notes, <laughs> number three, um, regarding convicted of a cannabis related offense and or a family member impacted by incarceration. Um, and you said that this would be submitted by an applicant or would this be a search with VCIC? And I was wondering whether or not there have been conversations with the Vermont VCIC. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's Vermont's um, uh, criminal records right. checked <laughs> group, what information they can actually provide. Um, and whether or not it would be provided directly to the CCB or it would be provided by the applicant, you know, through an application process that the applicant would obtain their criminal record and then submit that to the CCB. And I know that's really detail oriented, but I think they have, 
there may be limitations and or mm -hmm. You might not be able to get the information you need so i just wanted to check in on that and that you know you can research that on your own so maybe it's more of a comment than it is a question thanks no uh, stephanie that's a great point are you able to see my screen right now stephanie because it, it is the third bullet point on mine as well yes i see thank you okay great um we would have people submit along with their application proof of an arrest or can conviction. We have spoken to General Counsel David Shear, who said they would be able to provide that information uh, by going down to court. I'm not sure how the Vermont Cannabis Control Board would verify that information. Chairperson Pepper, would you like to add anything to that about verification yeah. on your end? Yeah, I, I, you know, we have, uh, the courts will have records, including of expunge convictions that are available to the person who was uh, the who has the conviction um, dating back I think to the 70s uh, that's where the kind of transition between paper and digital records happened in court histories um, so there might be an open question about some expunged uh, criminal convictions juvenile criminal convictions or criminal um, adjudications and potentially pre-1979 like, or 1978, I forget exactly when the, the date transitioned, but there might be a question about those or we might be allowed some sort of, you know, attestation or affidavit or something. Thank you. Okay, great. Does anyone else have any questions about the social equity candidate qualifications? Uh, I see, so divine, yeah. Saban? Saban, you're muted. Sorry, I lowered my hand but didn't unmute. Um, thank you. <laughs> I think th those are some great criteria. It, it sounds impressive that the level of discussion that you folks have had um, on the subcommittee. Um, similar to Stephanie, uh, not a concern per se, but a comment to take back and, and think about, and maybe this ends up leading to something that you folks want to tweak or maybe not. Um, but opportunity zones have have taken a lot of, of negative commentary in, in the other uses that they've been used for in the investment context of how they were created you know, by the IRS. Um, it, a, they're, they're a little random in how they're drawn and what they represent. Um, and uh, are much broader than just the groups you mentioned that they do happen to have a high correlation of folks who live inside them. Um, so, you know, I, I wish I'd heard it in the opposite order, but you were presenting it in the logical order, which is here. But I think you said that one of the rationales for opportunity zones is that there are a lot of residents who are BIPOC or other m minorities or marginalized groups. And if that already is criteria number two, um, then criteria number one might be a little duplicative or, or overlapping. But my concern is that there's also just so many more people who live in opportunity zones, since some of them are, are really broad swaths of Vermont, that we may be capturing a lot of people who, who aren't necessarily what was intended here. Um, and then part two of that is that a related critique of opportunity zones is that a lot of the opportunity zone development money that's being invested in opportunity zone projects is are projects that are essentially gentrification and the worst type of gentrification. So even if we decide that my first concern um, is maybe not big enough to warrant, um, we should be reevaluating this over the ensuing years because by five years from now, we may have what were meant to be opportunity zones and this weird IRS funding scheme that gave a lot of tax breaks to help people gentrify. And then we could have a lot of folks who are the gentrifiers who are applying for those benefits. And that would clearly not be what was intended. So uh, again, just to, to take back for consideration, um, it may still be worth it to include opportunity zones um, because it just gives a very easy factor to measure, at least at this early stage. So that's for, for you folks to consider. Mm. Thank you, Sivan. Um, that was a great point about opportunity zones. What we did was also look at um, tax reports as well. So we contacted the tax department and they said about 17% of people do not file for taxes because they do not meet the sufficient requirements. Um, so um, we also thought about just including high um, minority packed areas and with the opportunity zones over the 25 census checks that they do have, it really helped to identify who was the 
most social, economical, the lowest means of that, and then also included minorities, which we were trying to target as well. So we felt that it included both of um, criteria that were really important to include in a social equity program. And also, you know, all of these programs we will be talking about later should be reviewed, you know, every two or three years. There will be um, a number of years that we say once we discuss what a social equity cannabis board should look like so that we're constantly reviewing the information because at this time, you know, opportunity zones might be the best area. In five years, that may not be the case. Jim, but I, I, I do understand your concerns with, with opportunity zones, but we tried to just um, make a disproportionately impacted area the, the best that we can right now um, define it for Vermont. Yes, Chairperson Pepper? Uh, well, I just say, I was going to say, Jim, I see your hand raised. I'm wondering, Jeffrey, if your raised hand is in direct response to Sivan's concern. It is, yes. Um, if, if you don't, if, Jim, if you don't mind, if I take just a moment. Um, Go <clears throat> Thank you. So the reason the reason the opportunity zones came in and Savan, I appreciate you bringing up the gentrification point. I have the same concern. Um, the reason we brought that up is because as of right now, um, the state of Vermont has not conducted a disproportionate impact area study. And so without that information, we're trying to kind of capture the same idea without the presence of that data. So um, one thing if the board could consider is, is creating a DIA report that would be more accurate. So that's just that's why the opportunity was there. But thank you for raising that, Sivan. I, I think those are all fair. And just to put a, a final point on it, um, either now or in the future, if the one part that Opportunity Zones captures that isn't captured in number two, you know, BIPOC, minorities, um, other marginalized groups, ethnicities, if the one part it's not capturing is low socioeconomic status, um, as measured, as mentioned by Gina, you know, 17% of folks don't even qualify to file IRS reports. Um, in theory, we could replace number one with you are in the lowest tax bracket or don't even qualify to file taxes. So there are other factors we could think about to try to get to that, whether now or in the future, just to put that out for discussion. But again, that it might be that Opportunity Zones makes perfect sense for now, and those are things worth reviewing in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, do you want to uh, comment? Yeah. I just have a quick uh, clarification question. Maybe I missed something. Um, on... Uh, Cannabis-related offenses and the mention of the Vermont Crime Information Center made me think of this. Are there a list of excluded offenses, like an intoxicated, obviously something public endangerment's not included, right? Like driving intoxicated. Jim, Jim what, I, what I would, I, well, I, I guess I would defer to Gina on that, uh, if that came up in the, in the subcommittee. Yeah, I'm just curious. Well, right now we were going to talk about social justice uh, reform later. Um, so we didn't want to indicate violent or not violent um, at this time. And I know that there is criteria saying that if there would be, that the person would be uh, public harm, that they wouldn't be able to get a license. So therefore, then they would not qualify. Um, but violent versus nonviolent, if someone was drinking under the influence um, right now would not, they would still be able to participate unless they were a much larger harm to society. And they also are able to apply for expungement on those levels as well. Um, so we're just coinciding with what is currently on the books. Okay, thanks. Just, sorry, I know you're seeing my screen of all the people just trying to see if there were any more questions about this slide. Chairperson Pepper, do we need to have people vote on this right now? I I, I don't believe so. I think really what what the board needs just because of the pace that we're working at is everyone's input um, and comment and see if there's any major concerns that are be, that need to be raised at this point. Um, because this this, this criteria um, really impacts our market structure and fee structure. Um, and so, you know, that report, as I mentioned, was is 
due October 1st, and we're probably going to be a little bit late. So please, if, if advisory committee members have serious concerns about this criteria or have um, ways to, that they want to provide input, please, please do that now. But I don't think a formal vote is needed. Okay. And one of the things that I want to state for a candidate, it is not just someone who will get a licensee. Um, so we don't want them just to be just a license holder and nowhere else included in the cannabis industry. So this will also be for someone who's getting additional educational benefits that the program um, will have, which we will be discussing probably a little bit on Thursday, but most of that discussion will probably be on Monday. So we will talk about things like certification programs, um, educational workshops, because we want to in, ensure that at every level of the cannabis industry um, that we are having it as diverse and inclusive as possible. I'm just going to go to the social equity and DEI programs. Does, does anyone have any concerns about having two programs or two potential programs in order to have the most inclusivity for the state of Vermont? Questions, comments? Okay. I'm moving on. Um, this is our impacted family parent, legal guardian, sibling, spouse, child, minor in a guardianship, grandparent, grandchild. Any questions, comments on that from the board? I might add a domestic partner. There, there are you know, many folks who, who consider themselves similar to spouses but aren't legally married, and, and could, we could broaden that a bit. Okay. I will bring that back to our subcommittee. I think that's a, a good point. Okay, anyone else? I'm sorry, I'm just, I can't see if people's hands are raised as I'm screen sharing. Okay, thank you for your input about that. Gina, this is Ingrid. Sorry, I just wanted to chime in. Um, I know yeah. that you had mentioned earlier about verification of these, um, categories and does does the board or does anyone feel like it will be a challenge to ensure that folks qualify i guess maybe just hearing from the board whether you feel this will be things that you can verify easily i i don't know the answer to that ingrid i think that um if people are kind of attesting or, or swearing to that this is accurate information then it you know it really puts their license in jeopardy if they're not being truthful and so i think at some point there's going to be a low, low level of trust and we'll figure out the verify piece um you know as it comes up thank you Thank you for that question, Ingrid. Um, and just supporting documentation, is everybody um, okay with ensuring that people um, be able to provide their own conviction records and um, addresses of residents? I, I would throw in one nuanced one there. Gina, this is mm -hmm. Yvonne again. Um, sorry for yep. piping in a lot. Um, uh, record of a prior conviction or things like that. The one that, that I think about is what about someone who successfully navigated what has been a very burdensome system to get their record expunged? Um, you know, there is almost a ironically comedic situation in which they got that record expunged and maybe they shredded or threw out anything from the earlier phases because they wanted to forget it. And now how do they prove it? I, I don't have a suggestion because I don't know the system well enough, but uh, it's, it's, it's a scenario we should try to consider. I, I have a little bit of familiarity with the expungement process. I think in uh, 20, a few years back, we did create a registry of all kind of metadata on all expungements that is accessible by the expungee, the person that re received the expungement. 
So there is going to be a gap of about, I would say around potentially up to like a few thousand convictions where there will be no record of them. Um, but uh, at least from a few years back when we really started accelerating expungement um, and automating it as well, um, there will be records of those. But, but it's, it's that kind of, there is a universe out there, a known universe of records that are just permanently deleted with no no record at all, not even the kind of spreadsheet that VCIC keeps or the court and keeps. Chair Pepper, we might want to ask someone who with more expertise to help us consider what about uh, people who were not Vermont residents at the time, but now are, right? There may be many people in different scenarios from other states or, or, other, or other areas. So uh, again, I'm, I don't have the expertise for that, but that might be one worth looking into. Thanks Thank you so much. And it's really helpful. So as many questions or comments, it, it, it always helps. But I know that the Vermont Cannabis Control Board is aware of those issues and looking um, at ways how they can navigate around that. Um, and then our last point that we've made decisions on for the social equity subcommittee is that a licensed business uh, for social equity is at least 51% owned by one or more social equity candidates. Um, a social equity candidate must be involved with the daily operations and be able to make decisions for the business and that the social equity candidate must meet state requirements to open a business. Any comments or questions about this? Okay, wonderful. I mean, that is, as far as we've gotten so far, I will bring back any recommendations that were made by the board to the subcommittee group on Thursday. Thank you. Kyle, I think uh, you're going to give us an update on compliance enforcement and some of the decision points that were made there. Sure, happy to. I don't have a visual aid as Gina did, but um, if anybody needs me to repeat anything, you know, don't hesitate to raise your hand or, or speak up. So the Compliance and Enforcement um, Subcommittee has a lot on its plate. It has a laundry list of priorities um, to dig its teeth into and really starting and start to make recommendations to the board on how to proceed on certain things. What, what we did at the beginning is we looked at that and we also looked at various, lang various language in Act 164, especially as it asks us to prioritize working with our sister or partner agencies. And so a good place for us to start from that perspective, I thought, and um, NACB thought as well, was to talk about indoor and outdoor cultivation, inspection, compliance, and enforcement. And what we did was we brought in some, some agency partners, uh, Carrie Shiger and, and David Huber from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets um, came and spoke to the subcommittee a number of times. Carrie, um, Carrie is the director of the um, farm division at the Agency of Agriculture, which is the Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Division. Dave Huber is the director of enforcement at the Agency of Agriculture. And so we, we asked them to present to us how they typically handle um, everything when it comes from an inspection all the way through administrative, civil, and criminal penalties as it relates to issues that happen um, with under their jurisdiction. You know, the hemp program is housed at the Agency of Agriculture. They've got an extensive, they got extensive experience with licensing, inspecting, and enforcing any violation as it relates to the hemp program. Carrie's, Carrie and Dave have a team of inspectors already in and around uh, the state um, in multiple areas of the state. I think they have six inspectors in, in different regions of the state, and a lot of them are cross-trained to um, do everything from pesticide um, inspection and enforcement, hemp inspection and enforcement, uh, so on and so forth. They look at what is, if, if they see a potential violation, they'll, they'll relay it back to the Agency of Agriculture, um, whether it's Carrie, Stephanie, um, who is on the call. So Stephanie, if I'm, if I'm butchering this, don't, don't, don't hesitate to reach your, raise your hand. And also to Dave, if it, if it reaches an enforcement perspective. Um, over the course of talking with uh, the subcommittee and, and Dave and Carrie, um, everybody seemed to be in agreement that the Agency of Agriculture could potentially be well positioned um, to partner with the Cannabis Control Board as it relates to inspection, compliance, and enforcement. 
and we got to the point within that subcommittee where uh, the subcommittee voted unanimously to charge the board with looking to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Agency of Agriculture to act as its designee when it comes to inspection compliance and enforcement. And talking with Gary and Dave further about this, I think everybody really wants to see what our market analysis is going to look like, how much resources are actually going to be necessary from a human man or a human hour perspective in um, taking on this additional work and also a financial relationship between the Cannabis Control Board and the Agency of Agriculture and what that is really going to look like. How many licenses are we expecting to um, you know, start with? How many folks are going to be participating here? Um, and this goes for indoor and outdoor cultivation. So um, I can stop there and, and answer any questions, but as of right now, that's kind of where things are. I want to also just briefly mention, uh, because it's come up multiple times in the committee, um, this is technically not an agricultural product. It's a commercial product, and I did ask Carrie, do you have any experience in doing inspection, compliance, and enforcement on anything that would technically not be an agricultural product? And he said that the agency does have that experience. One thing he pointed to was um, you know, farm, farm worker housing um, conditions for migrant workers and how they look to inspect houses on farm where these migrants um, or um, you know other other farm workers might be might be working and there's there's a couple other examples that um, I don't have directly in front of me but there's some things some kinks that we're gonna have to work out with re with respect to that um, but from the agency partner relationship utilizing expertise that exists with our sister agencies um, we thought this was the most the, the subcommittee thought this was the most prudent way for the board to proceed at this time so uh, I'd love to open that question up to that decision up to the full advisory committee about uh, the cannabis board uh, kind of using the expertise in the cannabis quality program and the agency of agriculture more broadly to kind of be in charge of uh, or run the enforcement and compliance um, for the cultivation side of, um, of the cannabis industry. I'll take silence as a good, a good thing and we can keep progressing. I want to just quickly talk about retail compliance and enforcement because that's kind of what has been the focus of the last couple uh, meetings. We've heard, uh, again, H or Kerry and his team um, have some expertise from a retail enforcement perspective as it relates to the quality of a product, the shelf life of a product, how it looks, um, and they've got some, uh, they've got expertise um, at the general retail uh, establishments as well with how they do pesticide enforcement, so on and so forth. We've also received a presentation from the Department of Liquor and Lottery how they do tobacco and alcohol enforcement um, and and what their programs look like from an ID check perspective, a sting operation perspective, and so on and so forth. Um, both were great presentations. I've asked um, the Department of Liquor and Lottery to kind of take what they, um, what they do from an alcohol and tobacco enforcement perspective and how would that look in this industry specifically. We're going to have less examples of a minor walking into um, a dispensary because that will not be possible like they would in a um, general store so on and so forth and might try and uh, purchase purchase alcohol so um, I'm hopeful that the Department of Liquor and Lottery can come back to us with how they would perceive this to look um, again the, the the linchpin to this conversation just like the indoor versus outdoor cultivation perspective is really what the size of the market is going to look like and how much resources would be required of these partner agencies to um, help facilitate compliance and enforcement from a from a cannabis control board perspective. Billy, just a, a quick question going back to the cultivation enforcement. Was there any conversation in the subcommittee about the distinction between cannabis being a non agricultural product being grown in an agricultural setting where the there's two different standards that may apply to similar crops and just ensuring that the, the folks from the ag agency feel like they could uh, walk that line given their broader uh, enforcement role in the agricultural community? 
I don't, I don't think, Billy, that we got that um, deep within um, that distinction. But what I would say is if, if the, what I would imagine is if the Cannabis Control Board did enter into an MOU with um, the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, there would be a lot of, of training that would necessitate being able to draw that distinction and understanding and unpacking um, the implications of this not technically being an agricultural product. Great, thanks. And I'm, I'm totally confident that they, they can and will do that. I was just curious if you got into that point of the conversation. So thank you. Thanks, Billy. We're, we're grappling with that in the sustainability committee, but once we kind of have our, our heads above water, I think it'll start to trickle down. Does anyone uh, um, want to kind of weigh in on the, the, the question about ag enforcement or DLL enforcement on the retail side? This is, this is Steve Ahn. I can weigh in a bit just as a, a long long history of, of an alcohol side of Vermont. Um, I, I, I would think that if you're going to pursue the DLL option more seriously, it might be worth speaking to some of the industries uh, that they have regulated. Obviously, you have to take any commentary you get with a grain of salt. Um, but I, I would imagine, I'm trying to speak as democratically as possible, I would imagine that there is not a high satisfaction rate um, with the people who've been regulated by DLL um, when it comes to enforcement and the approach they've taken to enforcement. Again, must be taken with a grain of salt, but I, I would think that is uh, worth looking into rather seriously. Thank you, Sivan. Anyone else on that question? This is Stephanie, and just to be, um, and, and I work at the Agency of Agriculture, and I do currently manage the hemp program for the Agency of Agriculture, but on the heels of what Savan said, I think it might be worth also asking <laughs> the hemp growers and others in the agricultural industry how they feel about being regulated by the Agency of Agriculture. Um, just as, uh, again, another perspective, but similarly situated. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, do you want to talk about seed to sale? Sure. So um, the um, the subcommittee did did talk um, about seed to sale tracking. We did get an overview of what this technology kind of does and looks like from from one vendor. Um, but we, you know, this subcommittee it was not a charge from my perspective as a board member to the subcommittee to help um, necessary help to have the subcommittee necessarily help us decide on a specific vendor. It was more about a charge of, of what technology we should look for in a vendor moving forward. And I think it might just be best for me to read um, the charge that the, the subcommittee unanimously voted out of committee on what the board should be looking for when it comes to seed to sale tracking. Again, seed to sale tracking language was um, implicit or excuse me was explicitly in Act 164 as something that the board needed to implement um, as we as we move through this process. So the language um, coming from the board or from the subcommittee was the board should seek a vendor for open API tracking software and that stands for application programming interface software that is maintained by the cannabis control board and is login accessible by cultivators to self-report inventory. Software should have the capacity to track data based on both lot size and plant count. And so what this means is, is, is the Cannabis Control Board will seek a vendor um, that has the ability to link up um, with a, a software of a license applicant or license holders choosing. So, they, so, so we're not forcing any license holder to pursue a specific software company or brand, uh, but to do something that makes sense for their size and scale of operation. We thought it was also important to look at both lot size and plant count, um, recognizing that the, that difference uh, may um, help um, alleviate some costs or burdens on small cultivators. So essentially what, what this will do, um, from my perspective, is, is empower the board um, and our executive director to go out and start seeking, speaking with vendors, um, uh, whether it's through an existing state contractor, through a, an RFP, on software that we can we can impl implement here and start getting um, some traction on. Chris, you want to weigh in? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I have sort of a strange connection. I don't know what's going on with my uh, Wi-Fi, but were you saying that the license holder gets to choose what um, what seat to sell software they want to use? So long as it, it, it syncs up with what the Cannabis Control Board, and I'm not, a, I'm not a tech or a software guy, full disclosure, so sorry, Chris, if you're ahead of me here. Um, you know, it's my understanding that we can pick a software um, vendor and a license holder can pick a, a software vendor so long as it syncs up um, with our vendor's API. I, I, you know, I dealt with multiple seat to sales, um, metric MJ Freeway, Biotrack, um, and a couple others. And my personal experience is um, from the regulatory side, um, having five or six different options, the, the learning curve is going to be excruciating. And because the uh, enforcement or regulators that want to come to a site inspection need to be very well versed in all of those softwares, um, my recommendation is to limit it to like one or two. Okay, thank you, Chris. That's that's good for us to know as we as we look uh, for vendors to work with. Appreciate it. I don't I don't necessarily think the language of the the charge the subcommittee has given the board needs to be adjusted, even if that were if we were to kind of limit it to a, a couple accepted software vendors on the license holder side. I mean, when I when I just to anecdotally when i was running grassroots in brandon and we switched our seat to sale dps had uh, a huge problem with trying to figure it out and we weren't much help as we were trying to figure it out too and it, it really threw a hurdle into the regulatory process i mean they would come in and out in an hour usually when we were using BioTrack and then we switched to Cannabis 360 and, um, you know, it, it just, it, it caused ongoing issues for months, compliance issues. Well, thank you for that heads up, Chris. Appreciate it. Meg, uh, I'm wondering, I know your hand's not up, but I'm wondering as, uh, you know, the, your experience with seed to sale tracking, whether you want to weigh in at all on this question. Um, I will second a little bit of what Chris is saying. We actually at Series Med is in the process of switching their seed to sale, and it is um, no small feat for sure. Um, I don't, I can't speak to whether or not um, the DPS has had any issues learning the new software, but I can certainly. Um, Ask the director of retail at Series Med. Um, this might be, you know, a day late and a dollar short, but have there been any discussions about the the need for seat to sale? Like, are are there has there been any consideration of sort of sidestepping it? Well, it is explicitly mentioned in 164 that the board needs a system for seed to sale tracking. You could take that interpretation as like more of the lo-fi self-reporting and inspection kind of, um, you know, more old school model where, where hopefully our inspection backs up what, you know, that, uh, that self-reporting um, would, would take into consideration. I think, you know, with a focus on consumer protection, consumer safety, um, the, the risk of diverting this into the illicit market. Um, I, I think the, the subcommittee felt a little bit more confident in, in not doing that super lo-fi kind of process, but to to have the board go out and seek a vendor that, that would actually be able to do this, give the board data in real time, um, so on and so forth. Yeah, in my personal experience, I, and, and there are states considering trying to phase out of it, but uh, it's extreme overkill and it can be very cost prohibitive with updates uh getting people in to 
just the, the it, it it's very similar to like POS in the restaurant business where the the companies that make these softwares make all their money on upgrades and and uh you know issue based uh people flying out and and upgrading your systems but it's you know i've i've i have not had a good experience in multiple versions of c to sale in any of the locations that i've worked with them so yeah and it, it, it's going to be one of those things we've got to figure out i know like states like oklahoma don't have c to sale tracking as part of their program and now i believe oklahoma, like products from oklahoma is diverted as one of the major sources of the East Coast illicit market that, that's crossing state lines. So in the in from certain perspectives, it, it's something um, that we've got to go and and just figure out the best way forward from a tech perspective. Jim, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, I do a quick one. Um, not to beat a dead horse on the seed to sale, but uh, having worked in the food industry on the consumer side, where in supermarkets, you know, field to market uh, information is pretty much standard now. And yet, uh, as a consumer and a former editor, I can tell you that every single one you looked at, it had to be left up to the uh, distributor or to the, the you know, uh, produce wholesaler or meat wholesaler to interpret what the labels meant. Uh, often, if you asked a question to a, a store, uh, they would have no idea. So uh, they are very complicated. But also, that being said, I think, you know, we have a big medical program in our state. Uh, see it to sales essential for that. Initially, the, uh, you know, uh, license holders, the dispensaries are going to be, uh, uh, you know, doing a, a big part of our uh, product. So, I can't see how it would make sense to not have it. Uh, it seems essential and, and pretty basic. Uh, consumers expect it for a safe and reliable product. You know, and I know a lot of, of lending services and banks and credit unions want to see it as part of a program as well. And hey, complicated is what we do best here, right? So um, I think I, I would just, as we before we move to public comment and then adjournment, I just want to give an update. Uh, the market structure committee um, is zeroing in on their recommendations, which we can share. If you haven't seen it already, there is a spreadsheet um, that was prepared by Via Strategies with a basic market structure and, and with tiers of cultivation, tiers of retail, tiers of product manufacturers, and uh, associated fees um, for all of the license types. Um, and there's, it's a little bit more complicated than that to navigate, but, um, you know, I think that that's worth, we can, I think it's up on our website at this point. Um, that's worth reviewing, uh, even if you're not on that subcommittee. Um, I know the lab standards subcommittee is kind of zeroing in on, um, lab standard recommendation that we can, um, send out to this crew. And, um, you know, I think we're going to try our best to kind of get a draft of our October 15th report in um, on time on that new timeline and um, certainly it'll in incorporate the input and comment we received from the advisory committee um, other than that thank you all for the work you've done for bringing your expertise to us and um, it's just been an incredibly valuable learning experience um, for for the board and um, thank you to our consultants for guiding us through this process any last comments um, from the advisory committee or questions before we turn to public comment? Ingrid? Just a, a clarifying question. I'm just trying to know whether we have an idea of license, license numbers that are, like, is there, you, you've probably already talked about it, but I know that, you know, Kyle, you mentioned with regard to agency of ag or DLL doing different types of compliance and enforcement, a lot of that will be dependent on how many licenses are issued, correct? Well, yes. Uh, so the market analysis that's done by VS Strategy anticipates that we will need somewhere in the realm of 400 to 500,000 square feet of canopy 
And um, you know, if we are going to follow the directive of the legislature in Act 164, we really need to focus on small cultivators, the legacy market, and uh, to achieve that canopy. So there, so you know, there is an open question about whether there actually are 400 to 500,000 small cultivators in Vermont that want to participate in this. Um, but that that determination will help. You know, that kind of issue, and we're going to our our best. You know, approach to this, to answering that question is to have a provisional, a robust provisional license process where people can kind of submit a short form application with um, a non nominal, non refundable fee uh, that could help us gauge how much entrepreneurial interest there is going to be in the in a regulated cannabis industry, and hopefully, you know, we'll try and um, set up a structure that does. Uh, prioritize and favor small cultivators. And if we need to open up larger license types, then uh, based on that interest, then um, you know, hopefully that provisional licensing process will help answer that question. And then um, you know, based on that, we can kind of get a sense of how many product manufacturers, how, many, um, uh, test, how much testing capacity we're gonna need, how much retail capacity we're gonna need, and hopefully kind of make adjustments along the way. So the, the short answer is no, except we do have a basic framework that we're working with. And you can see that um, kind of basic framework reflected in both the market structure analysis and the kind of fee structure analysis or, or recommendations. If you want to kind of wrap your head around just kind of rough numbers. Thank you. I just had a question about the provisional process while the, the full advisory committee is here and the social equity uh, subcommittee is here. Is that something, is that nominal fee something they should be considering or is that, sep in your mind, is that separate than the application fee or should they also include that in their considerations for benefits for social equity applicants? Um, I think that that should be brought to the, it, the subcommittee. So that, the. Yeah. And I, when I say, I, I meant non nominal. As in, it's a real fee to actually gauge interest. It's not like the $25 kind of permit for hemp. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, I'm sorry we're running a little bit over. Um, I, we do need to open up to public comment. Um, Gina, did you have any concluding thoughts? I was just going to make a comment um, that we will be discussing that fee tomorrow with the Social Equity Subcommittee. Thank you, yeah. So um, we don't have anyone in the room with us, uh, but if anyone who joined via the link would like to make a public comment, um, please raise your virtual hand. And if anyone is joined by phone, I don't see anyone. Star six to unmute. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone. I know this was kind of a whirlwind of a meeting, but um, please, uh, you know, you've been doing so much great work for us. You know, keep it up. Thank you very much. And uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.